Hi, it's Layla again. I'm here to talk to you about my new book that's coming out very, very soon. Me and White Supremacy. I have the blue version here, which is the US book, the orange version, which is the UK book. And what I'm talking about today is week two. So a few days ago, I shared a video with you where I talked to you about a little bit about the background for, about the book, how it began as an Instagram challenge that then became a PDF workbook. And that is now here, almost here, as a hardcover book, um, traditionally published book. And I talked you through what's different from the what's pre what was previously there in the workbook to the new book, gave you an overview of how the book is laid out, and then went a little bit deeper into week one, which is called The Basics. So today I'm talking to you about week two. And week two is called anti-blackness, racial stereotypes, and cultural appropriation. So I explained in my last video that I, before getting into what is considered by most people like real racism, actual racism, that we needed to have a base understanding first. And so that's why we did week one, so that we could have a foundational understanding that white supremacy isn't just the N-word, isn't just what is what we blatantly consider as racism but that it's a it, that white supremacy really is the foundation through a lot of your thinking and how you show up in the world and so we looked at things like your privilege fragility tone policing superiority exceptionalism and so on so that was really necessary before we go into this section it was really necessary to get that because what i wanted you to understand is you know the word racism and being called a racist is very um, hard for many white people. It's, it's hard for everyone, but it's really hard for many white people, especially if you consider yourself liberal or progressive, that you hold uh, spiritual values that um, you feel make you one of the good ones, you feel make you an ally. And so before we jumped into me talking about, me talking to you about how you practice anti-blackness and, and you have racist stereotypes, I needed you to understand how white supremacy functions in, in your mind. So that's why we did week one. So now week two, we're going into the real sort of meat of it. Um, when I did the um, Instagram challenge, what I did on this week was I asked, you know, we were doing, we were, we were, um, in the Instagram challenge, we had, you know, the post and people were journaling under each post, but people were also sharing what they were doing on their own platforms. And this week, I actually asked people not to share on their own platforms their, their journaling for this week, because I knew it would be very triggering for Black people, Indigenous people and people of colour in their communities to see this without any context of what we were doing. Um, and the fact of the matter is, these concepts are very ugly, very challenging, and it it's not something that you should just be sharing out there in the world because it's going to have an impact on people who read it, who are directly impacted by it. So I would say a similar thing for the book, you know, if you are doing the book and you're sharing some of your insights, I mean, for the whole of the book, I would say you don't need to do that because it can come across as very performative or something that we talk about later in the book called optical allyship. Like you're just sharing it so that other people can see you're a good person. This work is really for you. You don't need to share what you're journaling online. It's for you. Um, but particularly with week two, I really want to ask you not to share online um, or in public spaces what comes up for you because it can just be very hard for, for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color to see that out of context. Um, and you might start self-editing the real, how it really shows up because you don't want to harm, you don't want to cause harm and you don't want to cause any hurt, right? So keep this to yourself in a nutshell is what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, I talk about in the intro to week two that this is going to bring up, uh, this week will bring up a lot of discomfort. Um, but your discomfort is small compared to the pain that um, BIPOC are facing um, uh, from these confessions of yours. So it's as uncomfortable as it's going to be. I want you to remember, and we talk about this in part one of the book, your commitment to this work. I want you to remember why you're doing this in the first place. And I really want you to go all out. You need to get it out. 
there are going to be things that come up that you're like, no, I don't really believe that or I can't really say that um, because if anyone were to ever read what I wrote down about what I really think or what I really feel, they would just think I was such a terrible person. And this theme that I talk about throughout the work is your desire to be seen as good prevents you from actually doing good because you're not willing to tell the truth. So I'm inviting you to really tell the truth, especially this week. Tell the truth so that you can get it out and then you can work on it. But if you don't tell the truth, you stay at this shallow level and you really just, you're just uh, going through the motions, you're doing the performance of the work, you're doing the performance of anti-racism, but you're not really practicing anti-racism. So in week two, we cover color blindness, anti-blackness. Now, anti-blackness is actually divided into three days, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. So you have anti-blackness against black women, anti-blackness against black men, and anti-blackness against black children. Three whole days looking at how you relate to and how you feel about black people. Um, I'll talk about why that is in a moment. The other days are um, racist stereotypes and uh, cultural uh, cultural appropriation. And then the seventh day of this week, um, so day 14, is your week two review. So why have I done three days on black people specifically? Oof. Anti-blackness is something that is global. It's found all over the world. And not only do black people face anti-blackness from white people, they also face it from other people of color who are not black. And I know that there are people who are doing this work who are not just white. It's why, it's the reason why when I talk about who this work is for, I say it's for people who have white privilege. I actually don't say it's for white people. I say it's for people who have white privilege because that what that means is it's for white people and it's for anyone who may not uh, strictly be white or 100% white. But in, as they pass through the world, as they walk through the world, people will either perceive them as white or just through that proximity to whiteness, they are given white privileges, right? So that's who this work is for. And so I know that there are people who are not white or who are mixed race, biracial, or very light skinned people of color who are doing this work. And they also participate in anti-blackness. Um, it Even, you know, myself and ourselves as black people, we also participate in anti-blackness because it's the lie that we've been fed, which is that black people are the most inferior people on this planet. Um, and so I wanted to look at each day in turn, each um, sector of people in turn. Um, something that I talk about, um, let's try to find where this is. When I talk about anti-blackness, I, I also say, um, though I use the words black women and black men for days nine and 10 and black boys and black girls for day 11, I invite you to also go beyond the gender binary and reflect on your anti-blackness towards black people who are transgender, non-binary and gender non-conforming. Black people who identify as LGBTQIA plus and gender non-conforming undoubtedly face even more racial abuse discrimination and harm than black people who identify as cisgender and heterosexual, so people such as myself. Um, so I talk, so I wanted to make that really clear, even though I say black women, black men, black children, I also really want you to explore what it looks like for people who don't fit in the, ge the gender binary. And then in addition to that, for each of those days um, in the journal prompts, I also ask you to consider how does that, sh how does your anti-blackness show up depending on how dark skinned the black person is? How do you treat a black person differently who's lighter skinned versus someone who's darker skinned? Because colorism is really real as well. So um, the, this this week is, is challenging, but I, I know that having done week one, that you have, you, you're sort of getting into the rhythm, you know how each day works, you know what's coming up each day in terms of the format, and you've gotten into the rhythm of that ability to ability to be able to self-reflect. So once you are big, begin um, day eight, you and color blindness, which is the day that I'm gonna do the reading from today, um, I know that you're much better placed to have this conversation in a more real way. But again, I really just want to press on this, please, please just be honest, dig deep. The deeper you go, the, the deeper this work takes you, 
the, the better that you can show up in the practice of anti-racism. So though it may be ugly and uncomfortable, that is actually the sludge that you have to walk through in order to get into the practice of anti-racism. Okay, so today I'm going to be doing a, a quick reading. Um, as I mentioned in my last uh, video, the book is also available as an audiobook, and I am the one reading uh, the audiobook, uh, but I want to give you a little taster. So today we're looking at you and colorblindness, and I'm reading an excerpt from the uh, section on what is colorblindness. So I'm not reading the entire section because it's quite, it's quite a number of pages, but sort of just the, the last part of it. Um, I wanted to read this part because I quote from an author who has a, an incredible book um, that really helped me as I was writing this book. I've also included um, the book in the resources section in the back. Um, I wanted to include this quote from him because I felt it was just, it was so good, so good. So in his book, Racism Without Racists, Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in Contemporary America, Puerto Rican author, political sociologist and sociology professor Eduardo Benilla Silva writes about the phenomenon of colorblind racism or what he calls the new racism. In the opening chapter of his book, he writes, Nowadays, except for members of white supremacist organizations, few whites in the United States claim to be racist. Mo most whites assert that they don't see any color, just people. That although the ugly face of discrimination is still with us, it is no longer the central factor determining minorities' life chances. And finally, that like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they aspire to live in a society where people are judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin, end quote. Sounds like an admirable outlook to have, doesn't it? The problem is the philosophy of, the philosophy of colorblindness does not sufficiently answer the question of why, if there are no racists, racism continues to exist. If white people do not see color, why do BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, continue to experience oppression. According to the proponents of colorblindness, this, that is not white people's fault. Vanilla Silva goes on to explain, more poignantly, most whites insist that minorities, especially blacks, are the ones responsible for whatever, for whatever race problem we have in this country. They publicly denounce blacks for playing the race card for demanding the maintenance of unnecessary and divisive race-based programs, such as affirmative action, and for crying racism whenever they are criticized by whites. Most whites believe that if blacks and other minorities would just stop thinking about the past, work hard and complain less, particularly about racial discrimination, then Americans of all hues could all get along." End quote. When it comes to racial colorblindness, what begins as a seemingly noble purpose, eradicating racism by going beyond the idea of race, quickly reveals itself as a magic trick designed to absolve people with white privilege from having to own their complicity in upholding white supremacy. Today, notice how colorblindness shifts the burden of addressing the consequences of racism onto BIPOC by asking them to stop talking about racism and just work harder and be more like white people. Colorblindness is a particularly insidious way of people with white privilege to pretend that their privilege is fictitious. So that's week two of Me and White Supremacy. Um, I want to encourage you to pre-order the book and share with others. Ask them to pre-order too. You can do so at meandwhitesupremacybook.com. The link is in my bio. Thank you so much and I'll be with you in a couple more days time to talk to you about week three. Thanks.